Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Church on the Move and Happy Easter. My name is Brandon. I've got good news. The tomb is empty and Jesus is alive. Yes. And that's the reason we're here today, to celebrate that fact. And as we get started, like we do every single weekend, I want to invite you to read with me our call to worship today. We're going to read from Luke chapter 24. And again, this is why we've gathered today. Let's read out loud together. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Come on, let's praise the Lord together today. Oh, praise the name of the Lord.
If that's true for you, give God praise one more time. Come on. Lift your voice. Man. What a morning. Hey, go ahead and have a seat for just a second. It's Easter morning. We want to say welcome. We want to say happy Easter from our family to your family. This is an important day for Christians the world over. It's an important day for us because Jesus died for our sins that we might not die. He was raised to life so that we might live. Everything about our healing and our freedom and our salvation and the life that we get to live is wrapped up in what we celebrate this weekend. And so we are so glad that you are here to join us in that celebration. My name is Lee. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, I'm one of the pastors around here and so is Priscilla. Happy Easter, everyone. As you can probably tell, we have been looking forward to this weekend for a while now. We have a beautiful service planned for you. And just in case you didn't know, right after service, we have a lot of fun planned for your family. So just north of this building at our 180 lawn, we are having a massive Easter egg hunt for kids, not for adults, I'm so sorry. That's happening just north of here, but we also have food trucks and inflatables. So grab your kiddos and make your way over there. We're gonna have so much fun. Yeah, we are. We're not just celebrating Jesus today. We're having fun also as a family as we celebrate Jesus. So stick around and be a part of that. We know on a weekend like this, there'll be a lot of you who maybe are here for the very first time, or maybe some of you who are here for the first time in a long time. Welcome. We are so glad you're here. In fact, we love having new people so much. We have something for you. If you're new, take your phone out right now. You can send us a text message right here in the service. Our number is 23101. It's up here on the screen. Send us the word new. We want to send you back a Chick-fil-A gift card just to go this week. Get a treat on us. It's just our way of saying we're really glad you joined us for Easter, and we would love to have you come back. We would. We love that holy chicken. It's so good. Yes, we do. One of the best ways to learn more about Church on the Move and how you can be a part of what's happening here is by going to a monthly gathering that we do called The Next Move. And what I love about Next Move is you get to hear directly from our lead pastor, Whit George, as he shares more about the mission and vision of our church. Lee and I and our entire team are in there. We have an absolute blast getting to share a meal with you and taking you behind the scenes. But more importantly, we get to learn more about you, hear your story, and help you find a place to belong. It's been absolutely incredible how many people have gone through Next Move that have told us that was the catalyst that started this place becoming a home to them where they found community. And we wanted to just share one of the stories from our friends, Lance and Brandy Ward. That is their story, so check this out. We are Lance and Brandy Salazar. We've been married about 20 years. We have two daughters. We were both born and raised in California. I think in the almost 20 years we've been married, we have moved probably 15, 14 or 15 times. But um, as if it wasn't enough, we decided to move halfway across the country. (laughs) So we moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we had no friends, no family, (laughs) no church. And we knew we needed that. We knew we needed a community. We knew we needed friends. We knew our real estate agent, barely. (laughs) Our real estate agent said, hey, you should try Church on the Move. And I remember thinking, oh, I've seen that name on billboards. What a strange name for a church. (laughs) But hey, um, let's give it a shot. Shortly after we started attending, knowing that we wanted to stick around for a little bit, we saw a host moment for Next Move. And we thought, well, why not now? And that was um, life altering for us. When I was in California, I could count on one hand guys I could call on if things were getting tough or I needed to confide or vent. So now brotherhood has been something I've either been involved with from a mid-sized group perspective to uh, mountain men. God has given me dozens of guys I know I could call upon that would be there in a second. I didn't realize that saying yes was gonna bring me some of the best friends I've ever had in my whole life. That one choice has opened up a whole community for me as a a mom, as a wife. I'm so emotional about this story. It really is one of the most beautiful things that the Lord has done for us, you know? Looking at where we are now and the church family that the Lord has given us, I mean, I, I know, I mean, I now I really know that we were meant to come here. It's about God's people. 
and I can't thank him enough for introducing us to so many of them. Man, isn't that cool? What I love about Lance and Brandy, they went from attending Next Move to helping us lead Next Move. And just like Lance and Brandy, we are all looking for a place to belong and a people to belong to. And we wanna help you find that here at Church on the Move. So we're actually having two gatherings in April on the 21st and 28th. So all you have to do to get signed up is text NEXT to 23101 or stop by our info hub on your way out. They would love to help you get signed up, but we hope to see you there. Yeah, we'd love to see you there. And like Priscilla was saying, it's wonderful to come into this room and, and do what we do worship God and hear the Word of God preached sit in rows like this. But we're not meant to do life alone. We're meant to build healthy, Christ-centered relationships that help us become the people that God's called us to be. I, I hope you got one of these when you came in. On the inside flap, it has a little bit about what's going on today. On the back, it has some stuff about what's going on with our kids. We want you to be aware of that. But also on the inside, you'll, you'll find a section there that's about community. It's about friendships, about relationships. You can get signed up at, with Next Move. There's a QR code in there. But there's also a little black section in there that says mid-sized groups. We have groups meeting all over the city, but we do have some groups that meet here during the midweek. And we have two that are starting this week. So if you've never taken that step before, you could jump in. One is a, a COTM Bible study looking at Colossians and Philemon, two small books in the New Testament. Those are, that's just a five-week study. It's simple to, to jump into. It's not a long commitment. Begin to study the Bible together with others, growing together, which is what we're supposed to do as a church. The other is a marriage mid-sized group called Staying Connected in a Busy World, where I think that's a, true for all of us. If we're married, we know what that's like. And working on our marriages is important. So you could jump into that. That starts on Wednesday night. Child care is provided. Provided. You can get all the information you need in there, but maybe it's time for you to step beyond just this type of a setting and begin to know some people. And so we would invite you, come, belong, come, get connected. That's right. Well, one of the most meaningful things that we do as a church family every single week is when we set aside time to give together. Yeah. And if you're not familiar with why we give, we believe that everything that we have, every good gift in our lives from our talents to our resources comes from God. And we respond to him by honoring him with our finances. But if you think about this weekend, he doesn't just give us the practical things. He gave us his only son as a sacrifice so that our sins could be forgiven and we could be a adopted into his family. How could we not honor him in turn? But what's cool about God is he is so faithful and willing to respond to us with blessing and provision as we are faithful to step out in giving. And if you've never given with us before, there's a couple of really easy ways you can do that. Yeah, it's simple to do. You can give electronically just by sending the word give to that number, 23101 give you instructions there on how to give electronically. That just goes to our regular tithes that help us do what we do as a church. But we have two other offerings that are unique and special. One is our expansion campaign that we're in right now. We believe that God has invited us as a church to expand here in the city of Tulsa, expand in, at our locations. And so if you want to give to that, you can just text the letters EXP to that same number. And then we also have one more offering called our compassion offering. That just meets immediate needs here in our church, in our city, and around the world. Many of you have given to that for years. You can give to that by just texting CO for compassion offering. You can do it that way. And if you came prepared to give in the room, cash or check, we appreciate that as well. There's envelopes in the seat backs in front of you and drop boxes at all of the exits you can give in that way. Thank you for those of you who give so generously. Well, let's do this. Stand to your feet again because we've got a couple more songs of worship. But here's what I was just thinking. I'm sure it was kind of chaotic in the parking lot as the first service was trying to leave and you guys are coming in and then kind of crazy in the lobby and and maybe you got up early this morning and you gotta put on some new clothes or whatever. And so let's just take a moment here, take a deep breath, right? Just prepare our hearts to, to give praise to Jesus for what he's done for us and then to receive the good news again because the good news is still good news for us. Can we do that? So bow your heads with me. Father, we pause just right now. It's been a good morning, but it's probably had a lot going on. And so, Father, we ask that you would quiet our spirit Bring us fully into your presence. Remove all the distractions that are waiting for us outside of this room. And let us come to see you more clearly. We're going to give you praise and worship. We're going to thank you for what you've done. And then we're going to hear the good news again. And God, I pray that it would change us. That we would leave this room different than we came in because of the resurrection of your son. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Oh, Lord, my 
my God. When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made I see the star and I hear the rolling thunder thy power throughout the universe display let's sing then sings my soul my Savior God to
the sanctuary. Bless the Lord. We serve a risen Savior, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, we're celebrating the fact that Jesus is alive. It's not just a theory. It's not just an idea. It's a reality. And that's why we sing so loud and so passionately. Thank you, thank you for jumping in with us and singing. It's a joy to get to worship together. Before you're seated, would you do this? Would you take just a few moments? We've got a lot of people in the room. Say hi to a number of people. Say happy Easter, and then you can find your seat. Happy Easter weekend, Church on the Move. Good morning. So good to see everybody. I'm gonna have to start all the way over here, work my way around. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning to everybody over here. Great to see everybody this morning. Great to see those of you joining us online. Happy Easter to you. If you didn't know, by the way, we have two churches in the uh, Department of uh, Oklahoma Corrections facilities. One is a men's prison, which is at Dick Connor. The other, uh, a ladies' prison at Eddie Warrior. And they join us as well. Let's put our hands together and say, hey, good morning. We're glad to have you guys and gals. Thanks for being here. Honestly, I know. I mean, when the room is this full, it's not convenient coming here and fighting through all the traffic to get in here and feeling shoulder to shoulder with everybody around you. I know some of you are really excited to be here today. Others of you, you were forced to come against your will. Uh, maybe a mom brought you, uh, a wife told you you're coming to church today. Maybe a neighbor or a friend or a coworker invited you and you're kind of wandering into this giant church and I don't know, it can be intimidating. Thanks for just having the courage to walk through the doors, truly. It means a lot that you would spend part of your Easter weekend with us, so thanks. Uh, before we jump in today, uh, I want to let you know that in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be starting a new series, so not this next weekend, but the weekend after. I'm starting a new series called How to Hear God. And if you're a Christ follower, that whole idea implies that you're following someone else. You're following Jesus, and to do that, you need to hear his voice. But what does that look like? Is it kind of spooky, eerie, televangelist-like, you know? lights, voices, that kind of thing, or is there something more simple at play for how God speaks to us? We're going to talk about that in detail, and that starts in two weeks, so we'll take four weeks to talk about that, and I would invite you back. If this week is a good experience for you and you really feel, I don't know, maybe God's drawing you back into the church for some of you, that may be the case. Others of you, maybe this is all, all new to you, but something is happening in you, and I don't know, you just, you want to be a part of it. We would love Love to have you back, and I promise, it's not like this uh, every week, right? So it's a little easier to get in and out of here, but we would love, we would be honored, honestly, to have you back in a couple of weeks. Well, uh, here in this community, we've been studying through the Sermon on the Mount since the beginning of the year, and if you're not familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, don't be afraid. Um, it's just a collection of some of Jesus' most famous sayings, sayings you've probably heard before. This is where he says, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is where he says, love your enemies. This is where he says, turn the other cheek. This is where he says, judge not, which incidentally is also a Metallica lyric. So you might not have known that Jesus and Metallica had something in common with each other, but they do. So today we're ending that series. It's, I think, week 13 of our teaching through sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. It's been so good for us as a church, and like I said, if you're new, don't worry about it, it's not like you're walking into the end of the movie, you're gonna get something out of this today. It will be practical for you as well. But if you have a Bible, I wanna invite you to turn to Matthew chapter seven. This is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. We're gonna read just a few verses. There's more here to get into than we have time for today, so we're just gonna read a few of these verses, and I'm gonna begin reading in verse 13. If you didn't bring a Bible, that's okay. Uh, the words will be up on the screen as I read. This is Jesus speaking. This is what he says. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it 
are few. Then we're gonna skip down to verse 24. Jesus still speaking here and he says this, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, my sermon for you today is really simple. I, I just have three thoughts, three ideas that kind of emerge from this text as I've been thinking about it, meditating on it, studying on it here for the last couple of weeks. Three easy thoughts that are, uh, I say easy, simple thoughts. <laughs> they're simple but not easy. They are, I think, profound because they're from Jesus. And I want to share those with you today um, on Easter Sunday. Here's the first one is that there is no third way. Did you notice that? Jesus only offers two paths. There's the path that leads to life, and there's the path that leads to death. He, he doesn't give us a third, a fourth, a fifth option. He just brings us to a crossroads, and he says, choose. Which way do you want your life to go? Or maybe it's an invitation to consider which way your life is already going. It's an uncomfortable decision. I think often we like to hide in the ambiguity of lots of options. So we have so many choices in life, we can kind of keep from deciding, but Jesus doesn't give us that option. He puts in front of us life and death. And this is really the story of the whole scripture. If you go back all the way to the beginning, this is what you find. In the Garden of Eden, you see that there were two trees. We know about the one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the one they weren't supposed to eat from. But there was also another tree called the tree of life. One led to death, the other led to life. And you see this pattern of duality all throughout the scripture. And right after the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, you find their sons, Cain and Abel. Then it's Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau. Then it's King David and King Saul. Psalm 1, the opening to the book of the Psalms, describes two paths to life. Proverbs describes two paths to life. When you get to the New Testament and you get to the story of Jesus, you find that at his, or just before his crucifixion at his trial, the crowd was offered a choice between Jesus and Barabbas. Who do you choose? Which one do you want? You get to the end of the book and you dig into the book of Revelation and you find the dreaded mark of the beast. Of course, Christians and people, preachers on TV talk about the mark of the beast. What we often don't note is that there's also a mark that goes on those who belong to the lamb. And there is the one who sits on the throne and there is the dragon. Again and again, we get this contrast of life and death and Jesus is inviting us to choose, to really consider which way your life is is going, what do you want out of life? Do you want the life that is really, truly life? Or do you want fleeting pleasures that don't last? It's an uncomfortable choice, but what I've found is it's also an empowering choice. Here's why. Because decisions are hard. You know this, decisions are tough. Some of us, it's hard enough deciding what we wanna eat for dinner, let alone where we wanna go in our life. Because to make a, a choice is to, is to choose what I want, but maybe even more importantly, what I don't want. And that's uncomfortable. Sometimes it can be hard to mine out what we're really feeling, what we really desire, what we're really after. And so choices are tough. Choices, particularly tough choices, require courage. And many of us, we go through our lives just avoiding tough decisions because we don't have the courage to face our reality. I know what that's like. If you've ever left a credit card statement unopened on your kitchen counter because you did not want to see what was inside, 
you know what it is to avoid tough decisions. If you've ever avoided the scale after Christmas, because you just didn't want to see what had happened over the holiday, you know what that's like. We avoid tough decisions. We avoid reality. And if you've ever made a significant change in your life, maybe a decision to pursue health in a whole new way, or maybe to get out of debt and to change your whole kind of financial life and habits, you know that what preceded that transformation was a decision to live a different kind of way. And that requires courage. It's hard to face the reality of your situation. And so most of us just don't even look at what's really going on in our lives. We just avoid it, pretending like it's not really there. Jesus does not allow you that option. That's why he says wide is the gate and easy is the path that leads to destruction. In other words, the way to hell is pretty simple. Just pick your feet up and go with the cultural current. It will take you there. But there are a few who are pursuing a different kind of life, who have the courage to say, I'm not going to live like everyone else. See, most of us, what we want from Jesus is a third way, a way where we can have just enough Jesus to feel good about eternity, but just enough sin to have a little fun in the here and now. And Jesus does not offer us that alternative. He says there's life and there's death. Choose. The question for us is do we have the courage to make that kind of choice, to choose the life that is truly Life, or will we just keep turning a blind eye to where our choices are leading us, living a life of fleeting pleasures, entertaining ourselves until we die? Jesus offers a life filled with purpose and meaning and real life, but will you choose it? That's the first thing I see is that there is no third way. The second thing that comes out of this text for me is that the path to life comes at a cost. Did you notice what Jesus said? Let's look again at um, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. He says, enter by the narrow gate, meaning you're not gonna be able to take everything with you into this new life that Jesus offers. There's gonna have to be some things, maybe some habits, some ways of thinking, your, your right to be in charge of your own life, like that's gonna have to be left behind. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. Most people heading in this direction, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Now, what does Jesus mean when he says that the road to life is hard? Does he mean that when you come to faith in Christ that you should get ready because your life is going to be miserable? A lot of people believe that. A lot of people believe that if they really go all in with Jesus that they're going to be, what, they're, what they'll lose, what they give up is fun. They can have some fun now and so what we want to do is sort of live our life maybe for a while. Maybe the idea is that I'm going to have a little bit of fun now. I'll come back to God later. Because what we believe is that to give our lives to Christ is going to be miserable. And so what Jesus means here is that if you give your life to me, you're going to be miserable for the rest of your life. You're going to read your Bible. You're going to pray all the time. You're never going to have any fun. You're going to have a sour look on your face, but it'll be worth it when you get to heaven. (laughs) Maybe you've thought like that. That's not what Jesus means. What he means when he says that the way to life is hard is he means that it comes at a cost. See, things worth having in life always come at a cost. The best things are not free, they come at a cost. Years ago, I went with my buddies to see the movie 300. I don't know if you know about this movie. It's kind of a sort of a fan, fantasy sort of retelling of um, the Battle of Thermopylae where the, the, the Greek Spartans with, withstood, 300 of them withstood the invading Persian army, thousands upon thousands of Persians, they withstood them and Kind of a fantasized retelling of that story. Has a lot of guys in the movie that look like this. And I was there kind of sitting on the front row of the riser section of the movie theater that we were in. Had several friends with me. My brother-in-law was there. We're sitting there watching these dudes who look like this eating our popcorn, candy, 
drinking soda. My brother-in-law, Dave, looks down the row at all of us as the movie gets going, and he says, I got to start working out. <laughs> right? Because we intuitively understand that you're not going to look like this, specifically this. Eating popcorn, candy, drinking. So this is going to require some different choices, right? If you want this kind of body, it's going to require a different kind of life. We just recognize that that's not going to come for free. And so if you value this, which most of us don't, then we would choose different things, right? We've determined that this is probably not realistic or worth having, that the sacrifice is not worth the treasure that we attain when we have it. And this is how life works, that things that are valuable come at a cost. You've probably heard the, this cultural quote, that the best things in life are free. <laughs> but it's not true. It's not true. The best things in life require sacrifice. The best things in life come at a cost, but the cost is worth the treasure. Or maybe put it the reverse. The treasure is worth the cost. So another movie story. I, uh, years ago, got roped into, cornered into, let's say, watching the Disney live action Cinderella. Have you seen this terrible movie? It was horrible. <laughs> We're having a movie night up at the lawn, up at 180, and uh, our family was going, and so here I am, just being a good dad, sitting there enduring this terrible Disney movie, um, watching this, you know, them trying to make more money by getting you to watch the same story they've already told again with different people. And I'm sitting there watching this, not really paying attention, just sort of making my way through it, but it, there was one scene that kind of stood out. Cinderella here on the left and the evil stepmother here played by Kate, Kate Blanchett were up in the attic, I think, where Cinderella is probably relegated to live. And they're having an argument in which Lady Tremaine, the evil stepmother, says to Cinderella that nothing in life is free, that everything comes at a cost. The idea is that she's bitter and jaded and she's lost the capacity to love. And Cinderella, with her big, beautiful brown eyes and sort of a, a tremble of tears in her voice, looks back at her, grand, or her stepmother and says, but that's not true. Love is free. Kindness is free. And I'm sitting there thinking... You moron. <laughs> Love is not free. Clearly, Cinderella has never been in love because love comes at a cost. And I'm not just talking about money and all the gifts that you have to, that, 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 that's a simplistic idea of love. What I'm talking about is the sacrifice that's required to really love someone. Because you know if you've ever loved someone that there's sacrifice involved. It's not free, but it's worth the cost. Every parent understands this. Because having kids is not free. And all the parents in the room said, amen. It comes at a cost, the least of which is financial. The psychological burden <laughs> might be the greatest burden of all. For those of you new parents who have babies, yeah, it's, it's real. The, the, the sleep deprivation, right? It's, it's, it's a real thing. Gang, our house was painted white. All the walls inside were painted white when we, st it used to be white. It was a beautiful white house. Inside, I walked through, look at the gorgeous white painted walls, smooth, beautiful, no dents, no blemishes, no dings. Now? There are marks and dents everywhere, mostly from my son, Elliot, who likes to show us how high he can jump, touching, there are marks all over the ceiling now. <laughs> and I'm going to have to have the whole house repainted, and I think about it regularly. <laughs> Walking down the hallway, and I'm like, we're gonna paint this thing one day, it's gonna look so good, it's gonna be clean and perfect again, and then I think, and on that day, I'll wish that it wasn't. Because the cost, the cost is worth it. I discovered this, I don't know, in the last couple of weeks. Or not discovered, but just I saw it play out again. 
I had a buddy, me and my buddies, we went to, to Bentonville to ride our mountain bikes. If you haven't been over to Bentonville lately, it's crazy what's going on over there. It's amazing. And so we were riding our mountain bikes all through. We've been into that for a little while. And, you know, 50-year-old guys are the same as 12-year-old guys. We just, we want to get out and prove how, 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 like what we can do, you know? And so we're out riding this, this tough trail with this huge drop on it. And my buddy Hank is the first one to go. See, I'm the smart one of the group. I encourage my buddies to try stuff first so I can watch, <laughs> see how, how, to, how to do it. So he's the, he's the brave one. He was the first one to go. And he goes off the drop and uh, it, it didn't go well. <laughs> Did not go well. Broke his collarbone. Like, a lot. Like, it's in multiple places. And so we were carrying his bike and him out of the woods, taking him to the emergency room. Uh, a couple of days later in Tulsa, I'm waking up early on, I think, uh, Wednesday morning, getting to his house six-something in the morning to drive him to St. Francis for his surgery go to the coffee shop, work on my sermon for that weekend, wait for the call from the surgeon in St. Francis, drive back, meet him there, wait around at the, the hospital really for, I don't know, more than an hour or so, just waiting for him to be ready, take him to get some lunch after the surgery, uh, take him home, take his trash out for him. This is not me patting myself on the back, please. That's not the point of this story. The point is that it's not like I sit around going, man, I just love taking my friend's trash out for him. Why do I do something like that? Because I love my friend. So is the cost worth it? Yeah. Yeah, it's worth it. Because I found something worth that cost. This is the whole idea of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus makes this really clear in Matthew 13. Look what he says. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy. Now think about that phrase. In his joy. What's he joyfully going to do? He goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. What kind of of treasure would you need to find to give up everything in order to attain it? Jesus says that's the kingdom of heaven. That's the kind of life that you get. There's a cost, yes, but the treasure, the reward, the capital L Life is worth it. And yet most of us, we're just kind of content with trivial pleasures, entertaining ourselves with Netflix and going to work, and that's basically our life. I'm here to tell you there is more. There's more love, there's more joy, there's more peace, there's more stability. There is more to life than what the American dream is offering And Jesus says, you can find it in me. But it comes at a cost. The price is he wants you. Not just part of you. Not just your belief. A lot of people, in fact, I like to say it this way, everybody in Oklahoma believes in Jesus. He's not looking for you to just believe in him like we wish upon a star. Jesus is more than just sort of a cultural, I don't know, hero, someone that we think about on Christmas and Easter, but then live our lives the way that we want to the rest of the year. No, look at what Jesus said. He said, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The reason why cultural Christianity doesn't work, and a lot of us in this part of the world are participants in cultural Christianity. I was a participant in cultural Christianity. I was willing to give Jesus part of my life. I held back most of it for myself. And that's why it doesn't work, because you can't go halfway with Jesus. He wants it all. But when you give him all, resurrection. Transfer. My life is completely different. If you could have known me 15 years ago, you would have known a completely different man. I'm not perfect, but I'm resurrected. I was dead, and now I have found new life. I went to church my whole life. But I'm different today than I used to be. But it all changed when I said, all right, Lord, you can have everything. Life is available, 
but it comes at a price. This is why I say Christianity should come with a warning label attached. Because it's not just praying a simple prayer and then it's over with and that's all you had to do. It's giving your life to Christ. And to be frank with some of you, you're not ready to do that yet. You still believe that there's fun to be had out there and you don't want really to give Jesus everything. I pray for you that one day you'll come to the point, and maybe, this is why Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, that maybe one day you will find yourself broken enough. I don't wish bad on you, but I wish that you would come to the end of yourself so you could find the life that is truly life, because until you really realize that you can't find what you're looking for and all the places and relationships and substances that you're looking for it in, only then maybe will you turn to Jesus and find real life. It's available, but it comes at a cost. Third thing is this, and this is my final point. You can't have the kingdom without the king. Now let me unpack this for a minute. What do I mean by this? Jesus is unlike any other religious figure that you've ever heard of, and there are plenty of other religious figures Different religions, think of them. You can, you can think of different religions and you can think of the figures that are associated with those religions. Jesus is unlike any of them. Every other world religion says, here is the way to life. Follow this path. Every other religious figure says, I know the way to life. Jesus stands alone and that he says, I am life. Dramatically, radically different that a man would claim to be life itself. And yet that's exactly What Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That kind of lightning bolt hitting earth changed things forever. So much so that we don't even realize, in fact, the world has become so different from the ancient world that we don't even recognize how different it is. Things today that have happened as a result of Jesus' ministry and Christianity specifically after that are things we just take for granted, think are common sense, think that this is just the way the world has always been. For instance, human rights. The idea that every human being has dignity and value, this doesn't come from paganism. Science didn't introduce to us this idea. It certainly didn't come through evolutionary theory. It comes through Christianity. People started to realize and recognize that we were made in the image and likeness of God. Equal rights, that comes from Christianity too. The idea that no matter what your gender, what your race, what the color or background that you have, you are made in the image of God and of equal value to everyone else that God has made. We think that's just normal. That's just the way the world is. That is not the way the world always was. You can read ancient letters from uh, 2,000 years ago, there's a Roman letter, a letter from a Roman soldier to his wife. And he's writing a letter like you might anticipate or think that any soldier would write, I miss you, can't wait to see you again. He was on a, some kind of tour of duty with the Roman army, writing back home, can't wait to see you again. And then casually at the very end of his letter, he just throws in, hey, when you have the baby, if it's a boy, keep it. If it's a girl, throw it out. This was normal. This isn't what monsters did. This is what everyday people did. If you had a baby with a debilitating disease, maybe you had a a, a child that was handicapped, you didn't keep it. You just take it, leave it by the side of the road. Or if it was just a girl and you didn't want it, you could just leave it out by the side of the road for the slavers to come through and grab her and do with her what they wanted. Or the wild animals would take it. This was common practice. It's called exposure. You know what changed all of that? Christianity. Christians changed that. You know what they did? They started going and grabbing those babies, those little girls, and caring for them and raising them as their own. We just think that's normal. That's just, of course, that's what people do. No, it was Christianity. It was Jesus that changed that. Compassion. That comes from Christ. This is not to say that the human impulse for compassion is only from, well, it is only from Jesus because he's the founder or the the, the, the creator of mankind, but in a sense, like widespread societal compassion, this comes from Christianity. There was medicine that was practiced before Jesus, but you know what profession rose out of Christianity? Nursing, caring for those who were sick just because they're sick, 
caring for the dying, even when there is no hope of cure. There's care that's available for believers and not. We just think that ought to be the way that it is. It wasn't the way that it was. When plague would sweep through a town or a village, guess what people did? They took those who were sick and they threw them out because they didn't want to get sick themselves or they fled the city. And you know who went back in and cared for those sick and dying people, often contracting the plague and dying themselves? Christians. Hospitals come from Christians. We were the ones who started them. I'm, I'm telling you, it's a different kind of world. Consent, the idea that a man can't force his way onto a woman just because he wants to. This is a uniquely Christian idea. Romans would give their daughters at 12 and 13 years old to be married to 30 and 40 year old men without their consent. They did have no choice in the matter. It was Christians who let their daughters grow much older and have some choice in who it was they, they were marrying. We just think this is the way the world is and ought to be, but it isn't, hasn't always been this way. It was Jesus that changed it. I would say we're living in sort of the afterglow, the last vestiges of a Christian culture. Maybe another way to put it is to use this flower as an illustration. There's something beautiful and good about our culture because of where it comes from, but as Ayan Hirsi Ali called it, she said, we are a cut flower. Meaning, you know what the future of this flower is. It's beautiful to look at now, isn't it? It's lovely, it's a beautiful flower. Keep it in water, it might last for a few days. But what's going to happen to this flower after a couple of days? What, what's going to happen? It's going to fade and wilt and die. It looks beautiful in the moment, but it will not last. I'm not just making a societal statement, though I think this is where we're living right now. I think we're living on the last gasps of a culture that was founded on Christian ideals, like it or not, it's the truth. It's where we come from. Founding fathers didn't come up with these ideas, they built off of them. But you know what I think is interesting? I think there's a lot of people who this is also your life. This is not just the story of the West, this is the story of you. Because you're trying to be a good person, you wanna be compassionate, you wanna be kind. In some sense you could say you're trying to live out the values of the kingdom. You wanna be a forgiving person, you wanna be a nice person, you wanna be kind, you wanna do the right thing. You're a cut flower, you're trying to live the way of the kingdom without the king. This is why Jesus said in John 15, he said, I am the vine. Life only comes through me. He says, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit for apart from me you can do nothing. You might be able to construct a beautiful life for yourself for a while. But what Jesus would tell you is you're like a man building his house on sand. And there is coming a day when the storm will blow. The rain will fall. And when that happens, the life that you've so beautifully and carefully constructed for yourself, it will collapse. How do you build your house on the foundation of a rock? You turn to the cornerstone, Jesus. You say, have my life, take all of me. That's the choice that's before you today. Some of you, you're ready to make it. Others of you, you're not. I, I, I cast no shame on you. You, you, might, you just might not be ready yet. Maybe you want more time to think about it. I would tell you that you only get so many chances. I want to invite you today to put your faith and trust in Jesus. Every other service today, I've done it this way. I've had it heads bowed and eyes closed, but I want you to keep looking up here because this choice requires courage. If you're in the room today and you say, Whit, I want that kind of relationship with Jesus. I'm tired of playing a Christian game or I'm tired of the life that I have chosen for myself. And today, 
I'm ready to choose life. If that's you and you're in the room, I'm not going to have you come forward and we're not going to have you stand up. But with every head up and every eye open, I want to invite you to say yes to Christ by being bold enough, courageous enough. It's time to take responsibility for your life. Stop letting culture decide for you. And you choose, like Joshua did, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Today, some of you are drawing that line in the sand and you're gonna say, today is my day. If that's you, and you want to declare that Jesus is Lord in your life in a new kind of way, maybe you used to believe in Jesus years ago, maybe you've always kind of believed in Jesus, but you're not really, you've never really given him all of you. If that's you today, here's what I'm gonna have you do, right here where you sit, I want you to throw your hand up and say, "With that's me. Right now, just put your hand up. Yep, I see you, sir. Yep, I see you. Awesome, yes. Here, wave at me. Say, so with that's me. Who, who else? There's more of you in here that need to do this. Yep, I see you right here. God bless you. Anyone else? Up at the top, I see you. Wonderful. Over to my left. Yep, I see you. God bless you. I see a little boy over there. Awesome. Anybody else? Wave at me. Might take me a second to find you. Yes, I see you up there. God bless you. Yes, over here. Anyone else? Wave at me. Yep, right down here somewhere. Awesome. I see you. Yep, I see you. Awesome. Anyone else? Just wave at me, wherever. Yep, right there. I see you, sir. God bless you. We're out. Over here somewhere, way back in the... Yeah, I see you all the way back there holding the baby. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? We're not done yet. There's more of you that need to raise your hand. Yeah, I see you up there, young man. Awesome. Anyone else? Might take me a second to find you, wherever. Right? Yes, sir. I see you, young man. God bless you. I'm following Jesus today, and I, I, I don't care what the cost is. I found a treasure worth having, and I'm leaving my old life behind to pursue Jesus. Anybody else? Today's your day. The Holy Spirit's working in your heart, and you need to respond and say yes. If that's you, just put your hand up. I'm going to pause here for just another second, and then we're going to pray together. Anybody else? Where at? All the way up there. Wave at me for a second. It might take me. Yes, I see you. God bless you up there. Awesome. Yep, I see you. Cool, thank you. Thank you, anybody else? Yeah, 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 right here, thank you. God bless you, awesome, awesome, awesome. Where else? Someone else over here somewhere? Yeah, might take, uh, yeah, yeah, I see you. God bless you, thank you, thank you. Where else, somewhere over here, yeah, I see you. God bless you up there in the risers, awesome. This is great. It's not too late for you. Anybody else? I'm going to pause here for just another moment. We got another service coming, but we're at right here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. God bless you. Both of you. God bless you. Awesome. Anyone else? All right. Yep. I see you, sir. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. We're gonna pray a prayer together whether you raised your hand or you didn't. Would you repeat this after me? Say, dear heavenly, yeah, I see you. Awesome, one more over there, beautiful. <laughs> Great, Great. All right, say, dear heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place. I confess I'm a sinner. I need a savior. Jesus came for me. I believe. He was raised from the dead. I confess, Jesus is Lord. Lord Jesus, take my life, my past, my present, my future. I am completely yours. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. One more time, let's celebrate everybody that raised their hands this morning. God bless you. It's awesome. Now real quick, before we dismiss, if you raise your hand today, your next step is to be baptized. Baptism is a symbol of what has happened on the inside of you. It's a reenactment of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And we're having a baptism weekend next weekend. As you exit today out these two doors specifically, 
you will find signups for our baptism weekend next weekend. Some of you are like, I don't even know what that means or how it works. You don't have to. We will walk you through the whole process. It'll be super smooth, easy for you to do. That is your next step. If you need prayer today, our prayer team will be down front as we always are. If you have a prayer need, something going on in your life, if you raise your hand today and you'd like to talk to someone about the decision that you just made, please come forward for prayer. We would love, love, love to connect with you. And then don't forget in two weeks, starting this new series called How to Hear God. We would love to have you back. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for spending your Easter weekend with us. Would you stand to your feet? We're gonna close with this blessing from Numbers chapter six. And we here at Church on the Move, we like to say this out loud together, so we'll put the words on the screen and I would invite you to say it with us. Here we go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Be kind to one another in the parking lot. It's Easter. Love you, we'll see you next week.